Why have Dabo and Sabin started to slip at the same time? <sighs> slip. It's a weird, it's a weird way to put it there, Dan, but I will acknowledge the question as it was worded. What does slip mean? What do we mean by this? Do we mean they're not playing for the national title every year? They did play four consecutive years in the playoffs. So if we do mean they're slipping as in they're not in the playoff this year, I guess shame on Nick Saban and Dabo Swinney, they're slipping. I don't necessarily know that I'm ready to say they're slipping. I would go a bit further on Clemson than Alabama, but I'll hit on both of them since you asked about both of them. So Alabama lost two games this year. They lost two by four points. The contrarian would walk in the door right now if I had two mics, and they would grab the other mic and they would say, yeah, but they won a bunch of close games too. I, I know that. So what I'm not here to do is say, hey, this was a vintage Alabama team that just caught some bad breaks. No, that was a team that beat Texas by one. They beat A&M by four. Uh, they, oh, look at this. They beat Ole Miss by one possession. So yeah, there were some close games there. And I understand that this was an Alabama team that a lot of people, myself included, thought would win the national championship. And they're not playing even in the playoff. So yeah, by that metric, I guess expectation-wise, they slipped a little bit this year. They played for the national championship last year. They won it the year before. <laughs> what slipping are we talking about? We're, we're Right now, as far as I can tell, we're talking about a season that didn't quite live up to the loftiest of expectations. That happens a lot. There are a lot of years. I mean, I guarantee a lot of you picked Ohio State to go to the playoff, and until they got some help, it looked like they were out of it last week, as recently as last week. So there's just an insanely high standard for Alabama. But at the same time, I do think that it's, it's a very valid thing to say that you have some areas of concern. My biggest area of concern for Alabama has been player development. You know, two years in a row, I, I just told you they played for the title last year. They don't without Jamison Williams. And I don't think it's any coincidence, by the way, that J-Mo did what he did last year and was able to walk right in and grab a starting spot, the starting spot. And oh, by the way, a lot of those receivers who you thought would be on the field that weren't last year and maybe didn't shine this year are hitting the portal. JoJo Earl's in the portal. Christian Leary's in the portal. Treshawn Holden's in the portal. They got a lot of receivers leaving town. They just didn't develop that group nearly to the degree they had been. Now, what they had been doing was Devontae Smith and Jerry Judy and, and Jalen Waddle. So, yeah, I mean, they had historic receiver rooms for a few years. I, I think there's a happy medium between what Bama was in those few years where they had all those first-round guys, what they have been, and what they could be. You know, all, all the Bama folks want is what they could be. So, yeah, uh, Jameer Gibbs came in this year. Jameer Gibbs and Bryce Young, Bryce Young's not a transfer, but – Jameer Gibbs comes in again this year, and he is the focal point of their offense. Once the ball leaves the hands of Bryce Young, he is their offense in some of those games. And my point there is they're not developed in-house. And it's not because Bama is, is filling gaps left by recruiting classes that finished in the teens or 20s. Bama's in the top five near number one, if not number one, every year. They're about to land the number one class in the country again. They are a runaway number one right now in the 2023 recruiting class rankings. What does it mean if you can't develop guys? Now, when I say can't develop guys, again, I'm talking about the Bama standard, the one where everybody should maximize their potential every year they should be playing for the title. Is it an insanely high standard? Yes. Is it warranted? Also, yes, because that's what Nick Saban's built there. So if you want to acknowledge slippage as being a couple of years where maybe Player development, I'd add defensive tackle in here. You know, I don't think on the interior of the defensive line they've been what they have been in the more vintage Alabama years. As for Clemson, this is one where I think you got to dive in a little deeper. Because as I have told you before, there could be some serious slippage that it just takes a few years to see firm evidence of in the win-loss column. I know they lost two games this year. Let's be real. They still won the ACC. Uh, they were still overwhelmingly and ended up being the best team in the conference this year. So what I mean when I tell you it may take a few years is if I take a, a jet airliner and I'm at 35,000 feet and we're going probably ground 
speed about 500 to 550 miles an hour. If I just kill both engines, boom, it's dead stick. It's just gliding at that point. Even then, it still takes a while for that plane to hit the ground because of all of the energy it's built up and the altitude it's built up and the speed it's built up and football programs are the same way. So even if Clemson was not just slipping, even if they were tumbling, yeah, I acknowledge it would take a little while. They're not just going to go three and nine all of a sudden. So just because they won the ACC this year, you could argue, does not mean there isn't some slippage. I get that, okay? What I am trying to say is, if that's the case, if I found the magic ingredients to power those engines back up, I could save that plane and get it back up to 35,000 feet relatively quickly. So if it hasn't gone into a full-blown tailspin at Clemson, which it hasn't, then even if you're right, I still think some changes could be made here. But point blank, I am of the opinion they are as close to the playoff this year at, well, not losing to South Carolina, frankly. That is what cost them a playoff spot, as it turns out. But really, if you want to get more granular there, if he starts Cade Klubnik sooner than he does, they're in the playoff. I firmly believe that. I said the other night, and I'll reiterate it again, I really am the last one in the world to question personnel decisions and play calling. You never hear me do it on this show. I just believe it. I believed it in the preseason. I believed Cade Klubnik was going to give them a better chance to win in the preseason. And even if that wasn't true the first few weeks, it became true at some point this year. And Dabo never pulled the trigger until it was too late, really. Because even though he did pull the trigger, like in the conference title game, for example, Cade Klubnik doesn't start, but he eventually goes in and they run the score up and he goes like 20 of 24. I'm not talking about pulling the trigger soon enough to win the ACC. I'm talking about pulling the trigger soon enough to compete for a national championship. You may think to yourself, oh, even with Klubnik, Clemson wasn't going to be good enough to win the title. How do you know who's good enough to do what this year? I will maintain it's the most open and opportunistic year for a flawed team to win the title in quite a while. Georgia folks are going to push back at me on that. I'm just telling you. You, you got, even you Georgia fans, you, you got Tennessee at home this year. You had a very flawed LSU team in the conference title game. You haven't really been pushed. Now, you've dominated. You, you've done everything an elite team is supposed to do. I'm just saying it is a very winnable year, and I don't know what could have happened. I'd love to find out what could have happened if Dabo made the move earlier. But you remember 2018? How well do you remember that? I'm about to ask this question in another segment, so I'll ask it now. How well do you remember 2018? That was the fourth of four consecutive years where Bama and Clemson, Dabo and Saban faced off in the either the national championship game or the semifinal game. We were coming off Clemson-Bama part four. And at the time, this is only four years ago, at the time, I was being told by um, certain, certain casual pundits out there that the sport had to change Otherwise, Clemson and Alabama were just going to leave everybody behind. You needed to expand the playoff. That's what I was told. And now I look around, and the, the natural life cycle that has always existed in this sport has taken care of Clemson and Alabama. It's not that they're gone, but look, neither one of them are in the playoff this year, and it's still the same size it was in 2015. 16, 17, 18. You see, here's the funny thing. There's this misconception that when teams become powerhouses, like Clemson and Bama were, and still are, but they were, and really run and rush out over the sport for a little while, there's this misconception that every other program just sits still. And every other coaching staff just throws up their hands, and I guess we'll just have to wait for Saban to retire. You know, I guess, I guess we'll just have to wait for Dabo to decide he doesn't want to do football and go and do TV. That's not how competitors think. You know, so just because you thought at the time there was this insurmountable task, there was this unclosable gap between Clemson and Alabama and the rest of the sport, it may have looked that way at the time, but nobody was sitting still. Everybody had their focus on Alabama and Clemson. And as good as they are, as good as Nick Saban is, as good as Dabo may be, You've got the best in the world at some of these other major programs. Next to you, of course. You've got the best in the world 
And they've got resources too. You know, they can recruit too. They can coach too. They can X and O too. And they can go get players too. And they can instill in those players the right mentality too. And all of a sudden, you can have Josh Heupel turn Tennessee into what they are now. You could have Lincoln Riley turn USC into what they are now. You could have Brian Kelly come to LSU and turn LSU around. The point is, the sport was never going to sit still. Those teams were never, nobody has ever cruised for a decade or 15 years and just been the best team in America every year. That never happens. It doesn't happen in the pros. It doesn't happen in college football. But you know what you did in the process? You turned the entire sport upside down, trying to accomplish something that was going to happen anyway. You didn't need to change college football fundamentally. Dabo and Saban were eventually going to get beat. Nick Saban and Alabama were eventually not going to be the best program in America anymore. I don't know if we're there yet, by the way, but it was going to happen if it hadn't happened already. Clemson was going to face some bumps on the road. And if it hadn't happened already, it will soon happen. I would argue it's happening right now. You didn't have to change the sport fundamentally to accomplish it. Football and competition would have accomplished it. Instead, you torched the entire forest and oh, look at that. But look at, but before, before we even put out the fire, it turns out it was going to happen anyway. But you can't, you can't rebuild what you changed in order to accomplish these things. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, how do you know that part of the changes didn't contribute to this? Well, I know it because, I, you know what, let me back up. I guess I can't definitively prove that. So I guess you could tell me, and I don't have definitive proof otherwise, you could tell me the transfer portal is what neutralized them. I have a hard time buying that because Alabama cherry picks in the transfer portal. Now, you could make a little side conclusion that Dabo's unwillingness to traffic in the portal may be voluntarily putting Clemson at a competitive disadvantage. I believe that. Guy can run his program however he wants to, but I believe that when your opponents are dipping into a resource and you have access to it and, and you're abstaining from it voluntarily, yeah, I do, I do agree with that. I, I also would add a side side note that I think we may see Dabo Swinney change his stance on that a little bit. I think we may see Clemson specifically at the receiver position go and get one or two pieces out of the portal. And if they don't, I, I really, really question the direction there at that point. So slippage, are they slipping? I guess, I guess as Mimo would say, slippage is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, Mimo has her own Twitter account. And I don't know which one of you did it, but it's been pretty funny to watch, so keep it up. Guys, thanks for watching Late Kick. Make sure to leave a comment. I love interacting with you. But most of all, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. That's how we keep all of this free.